to welcome everyone um, to our fourth event in the Talking Animals, Law and Philosophy series here at the University of Cambridge. Uh, my name is Raphael Fazel, I'm the convener of the talk series. We are very honoured to have Stephen Wise tonight, uh, or today, as our guest. Uh, Steve is currently touring Europe to talk about the Non-Human Rights Project, and we are very grateful that he found the time for a stop here in Cambridge, sunny today as it turns out. <laughs> as many of you will already know, Steve is the founder and president of the Non-Human Rights Project, headquartered in sunny Coral Springs, Florida. Um, the aim of the Non-Human Rights Project, which is a not-for-profit organization, is to secure legally recognized fundamental rights for non-human animals. Steve graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from William and Mary College and a JD from Boston University Law School. He has practiced animal protection law for over 30 years throughout the United States and has taught animal rights law at numerous universities, including Harvard, Stanford, Vermont, and Lewis and Clark Law School. He has authored many articles and books, and one of these most recent books, called Though the Heavens May Fall, might soon be turned into a film or mini-series starring an actor from Game of Thrones. <laughs> Steve got the attention not only of Game of Thrones stars, but the world more generally, with his pioneering work on the legal personhood of non-human animals. The Non-Human Rights Project has been making international headlines since Steve and his team filed the first ever writ of habeas corpus petition on behalf of a non-human animal, the chimp Tommy, in a New York State court in 2013. The lawsuits that the Non-Human Rights Project has since filed on behalf of other chimpanzees, and most recently also elephants, um, have been featured in news outlets such as the New York Times, CNN, BBC, The Guardian, and now also an HBO documentary movie called Unlocking the Cage. Today, Steve will tell us more about the work of the Non-Human Rights Project in his presentation uh, with the title, The Struggle of the Non-Human Rights Project for the Legal Personhood of Non-Human Animals. Please join me all in welcoming Steve. Thank you. Um, actually, I thought I would come here and speak before I begin my tour of Europe. <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> you know, my wife always tells me, uh, never tell a joke in another country. <laughs> and frankly, this is the first time that even a single person has ever laughed. <laughs> uh, so I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much. I can't wait to tell her that someone laughed at the joke I made in another country. Uh, so, the Non-Human Rights Project uh, is an organization, you know, we, it, it is a civil rights organization that focuses on, uh, on obtaining legal rights for at least some non-human animals. So we don't call ourselves uh, an animal rights organization, animal protection organization. Uh, we call ourselves a civil rights organization. And the lawyers within it uh, are civil rights lawyers. And it's, it's just that our, our clients aren't, aren't human beings, but we don't think they, they have to be. And uh, in 1985, when my hair was the color of just about everyone else's here, uh, I had been working in animal protection for five years as a lawyer, and I realized that there was um, there was a systemic or structural problem in in, in the case of your client, which is that uh, non the non-human animals uh, were legal things, and that was a real problem. And I began to uh, to try to figure out how we're going to deal with that. And I'll get to the the issue of the thing versus person in a second. Uh, but the, uh, the in 1985, uh, there weren't any, uh, there wouldn't have been you. Uh, I wouldn't be here speaking to you. There weren't any classes. There weren't any, there were, there were very few talks about it. There weren't any, any um, academic uh, courses, no law school courses, no, no large articles, no books. And there, were, there was virtually nothing at all. And so uh, I realized uh, that uh, I'd have to, with my colleagues, uh, to really start from scratch 
and try to figure out uh, how we were going to uh, get to the point where we would be able to begin using the legal system, filing lawsuits, uh, especially, uh, that could um, reasonably lead to non-human animals becoming legal persons instead of legal things. And at that time, in 1985, I uh, estimated that it would be 30 years before we could file the first lawsuit. And it turned out that I was wildly pessimistic. It was actually 28 years. <laughs> so, so we, the, as Raphael said, it, it happened in 2013. Uh, so what, what we had to do uh, during that time was to uh, begin uh, getting some an aura of respectability to the whole idea that a non-human animal could, be, could could have a legal right. Uh, we had to begin teaching this in, in law schools. Uh, we had to begin writing law review articles. Eventually, uh, writing writing books, uh, forming organizations, and then of course coming up with legal theories that that have a, a reasonable chance of being able uh, to to win. Uh, and then. Uh, and this is one of the most important parts, is we had to wait for the world to get ready for us. Uh, because if we, uh, if, if whatever kind of theories that we, that we were going to use in 1985 would have gone nowhere at all. Uh, by 2013, uh, we thought that that was the first time in which we could get some kind of traction with our legal theories. And I think we, we did, and, uh, and we, continued to, we continued to do so. So in 2013 then, the Non-Human Rights Project, actually in the first week of December of 2013, uh, filed a, a series of three uh, common law habeas corpus cases. And it was, they were on behalf of uh, four chimpanzees in the state of New York. And so I want to spend most of my time talking about how those came to be and then what the Non-Human Rights Project is, is now doing and is going to be. So one of the most important things that, that we had to figure out was uh, what's, what sort of, of a cause of action uh, should, should be used. Uh, because there are all kinds of problems, as you might imagine, on uh, filing a lawsuit on behalf of the thing. And so you know, since Roman times, uh, the world has essentially been divided between you know, things on one side of this legal wall, that I call it, and persons on the other side. And where you are is determinative of what's going to happen to you. Uh, so if, if you're a thing, you uh, lack the capacity for any kind of a legal right. You're essentially invisible to civil law, a, a small c, civil law, actually probably law of large c too. Uh, you don't count at all in jurisprudence. Uh, you're not seen as having uh, inherent value, but only instrumental value for legal persons. So on the other hand, legal persons are seen as having inherent value, a great deal of uh, in inherent value. Uh, we're all legal persons here. We, we all count in the legal system in some kind of a fundamental way. And we have the capacity for for one or ten or an infinite number of legal rights. Now, I think I have one thing here. My water. Uh, sometimes I show that what what a legal. I try to demonstrate what a legal person is because uh, you know one problem I oftentimes have is that judges I'm in front of don't understand what a legal person is. And one of the problems that the non-human rights problem uh, inevitably has is that. Uh, many judges believe that legal person and human being are synonyms. And so the first thing we have to do is try to explain to them that legal person and um, human being are not synonyms. That a synonym, synonym, a legal person is a, I have one more shot at it. A <laughs> human being is a legal person. But many, Many human beings over the years have not been legal persons. So on, on, on the same side, uh, there at one point, uh, uh, slaves were not persons. Women might not have been persons. Children might not have been persons since, since Roman times. And a lot of the civil rights activity over the last uh, centuries have been, have been involved with moving 
human beings who are legal things and moving them through this wall, kind of that semi-permeable wall, over to the side of being a legal person. And that has now all been done. But it, but it is a process, and sometimes judges don't understand that it, that it, that it is a process. And so the process, we argue, continues. And also, we, have, we try to point out to judges, on the other hand, that there have always been entities who are not human beings, who are legal persons, who have the capacity for rights. And so corporations are, are a famous example, or ships. Or probably uh, the University of Cambridge likely is a person. Uh, or the uh, UK is probably, for uh, at least some purposes, a person. But you know, more to the point for us, uh, if in uh, New Zealand, some of our, you know, our sister common law countries, uh, over the last couple of years, the Wanganui River has been declared to be a, a, a person, which means it has whatever rights and responsibilities or rights or duties uh, that a person has in New Zealand. Uh, a national park has been made a person. In England, uh, in, sorry, in India, uh, in the uh, 1925, a Hindu idol was a person. A mosque has, has been uh, made to be a person. In 2000, uh, the Indian Supreme Court held that the holy books of the Sikh religion is a person. And they mean it literally, that they are they are persons. They are a, they have a capacity for rights. Ah, so before I, I didn't mean to put this down. So sometimes how I uh, can explain uh, in a way that perhaps even judges can understand what what a person is. So I said, look. Oftentimes I, I try to have an, an empty container here, so this be my hand. And so I have an empty container here. So without anything at all, if you if I pretend that every droplet in this bottle is, is a legal right. So I can just kind of spill it on the floor. Nobody has those legal rights. There, you have to have a legal rights container. So something has to hold the legal rights. And the legal term for that is person. You know, a person is a legal rights container. And so what the Non-Human Rights Project try, tries to do is to, is, to either, is to have the judges create or better still recognize that, that it always has existed that there are at least certain non-human animals who are persons, who ought to be legal rights containers. So they have at least the capacity for rights. And when we file suit, we ask that, that they be given a specific right, which is the right to bond and liberty, because we use the writ of habeas corpus, which I'll talk about. And, but then, once, you, once it's understood that, uh, that an entity is a, has, is a person, they have the capacity for any kind of legal right, then you can begin litigating or going into parliaments and begin dropping you know, one right at a time saying, shouldn't, shouldn't uh, this person have this right, or this right, or this right? But first, you have to make sure that we're dealing with a, a legal container. So our clients have to be persons. Now, you don't necessarily have to say they're persons. If, if, if a judge or a legislature gives an entity a legal right, well, then they're automatically persons because remember, a legal right is the capacity. A legal person is sorry, I'm a little jet lagged. <laughs> so a uh, a a legal person, remember, is, is an entity with the capacity for a right. So if they have a right, it obviously means that they have the capacity for a right as well. So what right are we looking for? What cause of action, as we lawyers would say? Uh, where, where we try, did we decide that we wanted to bring? Well, um, Raph, Raphael uh, spoke about a book I wrote uh, uh, that's called Though the Heavens May Fall, which uh, tells the story of the 1772 case uh, in London of, of uh, Somerset versus Stewart, where essentially Lord Mansfield uh, ended human slavery in England uh, in that on June 22nd, 1772, in that case. And, and uh, he said that slavery was so odious. They used the word odious. And I, I like it when I'm in front of an English-speaking audience because it's really hard to convey how awful odious is to people who are not native English speakers. There's not many things that are worse than odious. So he said that uh, uh, slavery, some of the human slavery of James Somerset, was so odious that the common law uh, uh, would, not, would not support it. 
Now, that case was brought as a writ of habeas corpus. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Not only that, I'll get to the second, it was brought as a common law writ of habeas corpus. So a writ of habeas corpus, or habeas corpus, is Latin for you have the body. And it developed in England uh, beginning in the 13th or 14th centuries. And by the time of, of the Somerset case uh, in 1771, it had begun, it had really taken on the form that, that we, we, we understand today, which is essentially somebody is detaining somebody else without their consent. And that somebody could be uh, you know, the British government, or that somebody could be my next door neighbor. You could, have a, you could have a private detention, you could have a public detention. And when that happens, because someone's bodily liberty is at stake, and the courts, uh, in have, at least common law courts, but, but I think civil law courts as well, uh, have so valued bodily liberty that they, have, they, the, they use the writ of habeas corpus as a way of, of quickly determining whether or not uh, the detainee was being held against her will or, or not. And if she was, uh, then they, they ordered her free. And this would happen uh, relatively quickly. It's supposed to be kind of free form. It's supposed to be a summary writ. Uh, it, it, the, it, it's supposed to happen fast, and, it's, and, uh, and if someone is being detained, then they're supposed to be let go. So, indeed, that's what happened in the Somerset case, where James Somerset uh, was a slave brought from Boston, and he was, uh, he was held in, in London, and uh, he, in, in October of 1771, he escaped, and, he, uh, and his uh, angry master, Charles Stewart, then hired slave catchers in London to find him, and I think it took uh, 73 days to find him. They found him, they put him on a ship, and they were going to send him to Jamaica, where he would then be sold on the slave markets and live the three to five years of the slave who harvested sugar cane in Jamaica lived. Before they could do that, someone, probably his godparents, but in its infinite wisdom, uh, the folks in charge of the judicial records in England uh, 105 years ago decided that they were going to kind of like clean house. And one of the things they cleaned was they threw out the original petition for habeas corpus on behalf of James Somerset. Uh, so we'll never know for sure, but it was likely his godparents uh, who, who did that. And the reason, the reason that black slaves got godparents in the 18th century was because they were under the delusion that one Christian uh, would not imprison another Christian, would not enslave another Christian. Uh, no matter how many times they saw that that was not true, uh, they still became Christians and God godparents. But what they began, what they really used them for, was to help them escape. That was the function of a godfather, a godparent in, in London, who was played in the 18th century. And so uh, it, it worked. You know, he, indeed, he indeed was free. Slavery uh, indeed was essentially over, at least in in the mainland England, not in the colonies, but that was going to have to take works of Parliament, but through Lord Mansfield, uh, who was over in, in uh, England, at least. So I looked at that and thought, I want to, we're going to use our, our first cause of action, the writ of habeas corpus. It's fast. Uh, <clears throat> another thing it does is that it doesn't burden us with the problem of standing. And in, 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 in the United States and in, in a lot of countries, have the, there, there's such a thing called standing, which means that uh, the person, and again, the only one who has the power to file a lawsuit would be a person, because you have the right to file a lawsuit, so you have to be a person, and that could be one, one of your rights. So uh, the person who files a lawsuit also has to be the, the one who's injured. So if you and I enter into a contract and you breach it, then if I don't want to sue you, someone else cannot sue you because they'll be thrown out of court because they, they lack standing, they haven't been injured. In fact, one of the paradoxes that, that exists, which is one of the reasons the non-human rights project exists, is that in order to be able to file a successful lawsuit, it has to be done by a person who is injured. The problem is, if you're, if you're suing on behalf of a non-human animal, she's been injured, but she's not a person. As a human being sues to, like, I, like I'm suing, uh, I'm a person, but I haven't been injured. So the injured person isn't a person. 
<coughs> person who isn't a person is being injured. Uh, and so that stops lawsuits on behalf of, of uh, the fundamental interests of non-human animals dead, just like it does for people trying to sue on behalf of environmental uh, objects or, or the environment, if you have that sort of standing as you, as, as you do in the US. So that so standing is a problem that was taken care of usually in habeas corpus cases because of the fact that judges realized that when someone's being detained against their will, the detainer didn't let the detained person out in order to go file a lawsuit. So some third party would have to then file a lawsuit on behalf of the detained person. So they, they wouldn't have to be injured. And so we wanted that. We wanted to get rid of the standing problem. So that was another reason we saw rid of habeas corpus. Another reason is that, as I said, they're really fast. So if we're going to win, especially if we're going to lose, we want to, and we fully expected to lose, because we understood that when something goes on for 2,000 years in the law, you're not about to waltz in on the first case, or the fifth case, or maybe not even on the tenth case, or twentieth case, and all of a sudden the judge is going to say, holy smoke, 20, after 2,000 years we've been screwing up the whole time, you win, we're really sorry. That's, <laughs> that's just generally not how judges work. So we figured that we were going to be in a long fight. And so we didn't want to have the case, each case take a long time to lose. If we are going to lose, we wanted to lose fast. And, and we did lose fast, uh, so which, which is something that was OK with us. Uh, so uh, in New York, for example, uh, when you are seeking a writ of habeas corpus, you go into court, you go in ex parte, which means without the other side being there, and ask that the judge issue a writ of habeas corpus. And as I'll talk about it, it or may not. But what, what happens is that the judge would go in, judge, would you issue a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of the chimpanzee? The judge would say no. He'd say thank you. That was it. We lost. We lost in 10 minutes. Uh, but that, then we could appeal. So at least we didn't have to wait you know, for five years to lose. We could lose in 10 minutes. And in fact, what we wanted to do was get up to the appellate courts anyway. Uh, so, that, so we would seek a writ of habeas corpus. And also, we would, we would seek it under the common law. So, and this is one of the few audiences I have around the world where I don't have to explain what the common law is. You might have had some idea. So, the common law essentially is a law that judges make while they're in the process of deciding cases. English speaking judges make in the, in the process of deciding cases. When I speak to people who are not from the common law world, the idea that judges make law is something that's usually foreign to them. Uh, so, I say, yes, a common law judge can actually make law in the interstices of legislation, and, and, and they do. American judges are a little bit, a lot more loose about that. Uh, they make a lot more law, but, uh, but English judges um, can do it, do it as well. Uh, so what we wanted to do then was go in on a writ of habeas corpus, but not just any writ, not a statutory writ of habeas corpus or a constitutional habeas corpus or an international, if they existed, writ of habeas corpus, but a common law writ of habeas corpus so that we could argue to the judge that, look, judge, you judges, it wasn't you, it was your, you know, your forefathers or your mothers, but it was your fathers, were the ones who designated not all non-human animals as legal things a long, long time ago. And that the common law is supposed to evolve in light of changing scientific uh, discovery, in light of changing uh, morals, uh, in uh, ethics, in, in uh, changing human experience, it's supposed to evolve. And so we want to be prepared then, to re or re we're prepared to show you that, that uh, morality has evolved, ex human experience has changed, there's been a massive amount of scientific evidence that shows that our non-human animal uh, plaintiff is not what a judge would have, judges would have thought they were you know, 500 years ago or even 100 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago. And so we want you who made this proclamation, this, uh, this legal statement that all non-human animals are things, you, we want you now to unmake it in, in light of, of, the, of the changes that we're going to put in front of you. Because we're concerned that if we, if we uh, file suit uh, and claim that a, say, our, 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 an elephant uh, is a person within the meaning of a certain statute that uses the word person, 
what's likely to happen is that the court is going to say they're going to look at the legislative history of that statute, and they're going to conclude that when the legislature used the word person, they didn't, they weren't thinking about elephants. They were thinking about some kind of, of, of human being. So we, the same thing if you had it in, in a written constitution, which we have. Um, and so we didn't want a judge to be interpreting the word person uh, that somebody else had written. We wanted them to use the common law definition of person, and which is was supposed to be, in, in theory, much more flexible. So that's why we use just not, not only a, a habeas writ of a writ of habeas corpus, but we use a common law writ of habeas corpus. Now, why did we choose chimpanzees? Uh, well, we chose chimpanzees, and since then we filed a lawsuit about half the elephants. We probably found other lawsuits about half the elephants and chimpanzees. We're looking at uh, the orcas being held captive at SeaWorld in San Diego. Uh, but why do we choose those sorts of non-human animals? Uh, it's generally the same reason. One, all of those animals are not indigenous to the United States. So there's relatively few of them, which means there are not gigantic economic interests in them. And so we do not have gigantic economic interests allied against us, at least at, at the beginning of, of, of our work. So there's few of them. They have, they have low, low economic interests. they are also been the subject of a lot of cognition research. And the research has shown that they're extraordinarily cognitively complex. And so we want to make arguments around their extraordinary cognitive complexity. Now, this raises the issue as to why would we care about their cognitive complexity. Well, when we're deciding where we want to file suit, because we filed that lawsuit in, in the state of New York, uh, we, chose the state, took us, we chose the state of New York after looking at, all, at, the, at, at, the, at the law of all 50 states of, of the UK, of South Africa, India, all, uh, probably 20 English-speaking countries with a common law heritage. And we ended up um, liking the state of New York the best. Um, but what are we looking for? Why, why do we care? The reason that we care is that we suspected, and I'm sure we suspected correctly, that most judges would think that what we're doing was really weird, and that they were not going to listen to us or as carefully as we might want. By the way, and they don't listen to us as carefully as we might want. Many judges that we go in front of, in front of, clearly have no idea what we're talking about, and we, we, frankly, they have less idea than we had hoped when we began, began litigating. But that we, we see that, uh, and if you see the film on Un Unlocking the Cage, which plays on BBC Four uh, now and then, I know, um, you'll see one judge, maybe not coincidentally, the only female trial judge we've ever drawn, who understands what we're doing. A lot, of the, the, a lot of the male trial judges we draw are clueless and arrogant. They're arrogant but clueless. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're hoping that changes as, as you keep bringing these cases and, and, and things evolve. But you'll see Justice Jaffe, she grasps what we're doing. She grasps what, what we're doing. She's only on film, you uh, know, made for. Uh, a few minutes, but you can get the you can get the idea. You, although you, it's not just uh, like a man, men and women divide. You'll also be able to see an appellate judge, female appellate judge, who clearly wants to leap over the bench and slap me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's not just men and women, but but at least at at the at the that the trial level, uh, the only female judge we ever had was was, was we thought the, the one that we that we thought the the furthest. Uh, with. So when we looked at these jurisdictions, what we want, the reason we were doing that is we wanted to try to understand, or one of the reasons, what were the values and principles that the judges in that jurisdiction claimed to hold? What do they think is important you know, as judges, as demonstrated in their judicial decisions? And we would see the same things again and again. Uh, the ideas of equality, of liberty, uh, of autonomy, and that that would, that would be kind of part of part of liberty, but also part of part of autonomy. And so uh, we then, after understanding liberty, equality, and autonomy, were three 
very important common law values that we then, um, then frame our litigation in terms of those values. So we go into court and we argue that as a matter of common law, liberty, our, our non-human animal client, chimpanzee or elephant to work with, you know, ought to uh, have a common law, the, ought to have the fundamental right to bodily liberty, the common law right to bodily liberty that's protected by a common law regulated corpus. And what we saw, with, for example, with respect to autonomy was that you take the state of New York, that there were cases that were now 30, 40 years old in which, and I'm, I know it's true in, in, in the UK because I, I know I wrote a couple of cases about it, um, where you have uh, someone who's in the hospital and he or she is dying and the only thing that will save her, her, we'll call her, her the, only thing, the only thing that will save her is if there's some kind of surgery which she doesn't want or some kind of medication which she doesn't want. And she said, I'd rather die than have this surgery or take this medication. And then the hospital then goes to the courts and say, essentially, we want you to override her autonomy and permit us to medicate her or, or bring her into surgery against her will in order to save her life. And the courts uniformly would say, we're not going to do that. Our respect for her autonomy trumps the state's interest in her life. So you can't do it. If she wants to die, then she can die. And so from that, we concluded that autonomy, if it's not the supreme common law value, it's certainly one of them. It's because they say it's, we, we, we care more about her autonomy than we care about, about her life. It's her choice that's the most important thing. And so when we were looking at non-human animal clients, we would go to the experts in that field, the people who studied you know, chimpanzees or, or studied elephants, or, you know, for their whole lives. Uh, 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You know, Jane Goodall's on my board of directors. Uh, so we actually, you know, we, we also we thought about chimpanzees too. And so uh, we would go to them and, and learn everything that we could about what they did. And I've been thinking about this for many years. So in my first book in 2000, Rattling in the Cage, that focused on chimpanzees and bonobos. And my second book, 2000, 2003, added uh, African gray parrots and elephants and whales. But I had been thinking about chimpanzees a lot and done a, a huge amount of research on them. And then I would then go visit their laboratories, or I'd go into Uganda, you know, up into the Kibami Mountains and, and see chimpanzees in, you know, in the wild, and see whether or not there was enough scientific evidence that we could, we could argue uh, correctly, that chimpanzees were autonomous beings. And we believe that there were. So we, in the first, when we filed suit, we then, we then put 100 pa uh, pages of affidavits from the eight or nine top chimpanzee uh, cognition experts in the world showing that chimpanzees are autonomous beings. So the reason we then do this, which is that we we don't come in with our own ideas. What we do is try to understand what the values and principles of the judges are in that jurisdiction, and then we make the arguments from their values and principles, is that we're, we're hoping that one of three things happens. It turns out, actually, four things happen. We weren't expecting the last one. One of them is they say, uh, those aren't our values and principles. You lose. We'd say, OK, now we know. We're going to file another lawsuit this time invoking correctly your values and principles. The second one is they say, you are you're invoking our values and principles. We agree with you. You won. You win. So you'd like to give them that option. Um, the, the third one, and this is the one that's most common, is that these are our values and principles, but you lose anyway. And why? Because we say so. And that's really been a serious problem uh, for us. But we think it's a much more serious problem for, for the judges. because. An arbitrary and irrational or irrational decision is unstable, and it's not going to stand. And we've been the subject of several irrational, just irrational and and or arbitrary decisions where they just simply say, "I'm sorry." Uh, the, the last case we had involving elephants, the judge, which is on appeal now, the judge said, um, "All the arguments you make, 
they all come from cases involving humans, therefore you lose. And so when we filed a motion for a rehearing, we said, well, you know, there's thousands and thousands of common law rules. Guess what? Every single one of them was new at one time. And somebody came in for the first time and argued something new. And that's what we're doing. So if we're going to cite cases, we can't cite cases where non-human animals have gotten rights before, because no one's ever asked for that to happen. There's no such case. So what we're doing is we're citing cases in which black slaves sought rights for the first time. Or we saw, like we have a case in the Supreme Court of California, where a Chinese person was not allowed to testify at a, at a, uh, in, 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 in a court. Why? As the California Supreme Court so well ex explained, because they were stupid, because they had no history, and because everybody knew that they were out, they were barefaced liars. That's why they can't. Not uh, uh, Native Americans in the United States saw it. Uh, habeas corpus rights, and the United States government said, Native Americans, they, they're not persons. They can't, if, they, if, if the government puts them in jail, they can't get out of jail because they, they're not persons, just like black slaves were. I just cited a case where women tried to become lawyers in the United States, in, in the state of Wisconsin in 1876. And, and, and the, the court said, are you kidding me? You know, women, are, just look at them. Nature has equipped them not for being lawyers, but for all kinds of other things. <laughs> and also, law is so disgusting, the practice of law is so disgusting, having primarily to do with things involving sex, that we couldn't even talk about it in an oral argument because she was sitting in the courtroom. And other ways in which lawyers, women were just too, too delicate to ever become lawyers. And we try to show that that can't we just skip the part where you try to get away from not from uh, not deciding cases based upon your own values and principles, and and instead of having to say things that are irrational uh, or arbitrary now, and we have to wait 50 or 100 years so we can look back and see you know how stupid your rulings were, <laughs> can't we just skip that phase and go right to the phase of oh we're going to apply our um, own values and principles. Um, uh, it may not surprise you, I actually do not say that this overtly in a courtroom. <laughs> uh, but uh, I have been saying more and more in, in our public statements and in our interviews to the press in, in terms of it maybe it's time that judges start thinking about their place in history. Because believe it or not, after you're gone, the case that you're going to be remembered for is, is going to be ours. All the cases you did involving contracts and people running each other over with cars and all these, the labor unions, all that stuff is going to be forgotten in comparison to the momentous question of whether you know, millions or billions of non-human animals you know, can have, you know, are, are going to continue to be treated the horrendous way that we are treating them. That's really the social issue of our, of our time. So the fourth way that they can deal with us, which we weren't really expecting, is that they can try to obstruct our ability to appeal. We, we, uh, we've had that happen. That really shocked us because we never really we weren't really expecting that. So uh, in in one, well, one of the three cases we filed in that first week. Um, because it was ex parte, which meant the other side wasn't even there, when we lost, the judge said, I'm the judge said, I can't be the first judge to make this leap of faith. He said, we understand, judge, we just want to appeal. And so, because there's no other side at that time, we have to, the judge has to agree that what documents are going to go up to the appellate court. So, there's only, you know, we only filed two things, our petition for habeas corpus and our memorandum. So we file a thing saying, with the court saying, you have, these are the only two documents that exist. We, we want to send them up to the court. And three months goes by, and the judge doesn't rule. So we call up his clerk, and we say, when's he going to rule? And the clerk says, he's not. We say, what do you mean he's not? He said, he's not. You're, he, you're never going to appeal. And we said, oh, OK, yes, we are. And so we then go to an appellate court. And we actually file something that lawyers call a writ of mandamus, which a a mandamus means that a public official is not doing 
her job. And so judges have one job, decide. And so we said, this judge isn't acting like a judge. We want the appellate court to order the judge to do one thing, decide. He can go against us, he can go for us, we don't care. He has to decide. And so unfortunately for the judge, that was on Friday, on Sunday, we were on the cover of the Sunday New York Times Magazine. And the next day, the, the appellate court set up a hearing to the, uh, because we had sued him. And miraculously, the day after that, he allowed us to, to appeal and, he, and he, up we went. That paled into consideration we went in front of a, an appellate court, which is now actually under appeal uh, currently. Further, we go to an appellate court in Manhattan and we when we walk in with our appeal, they say, you don't have the right to appeal. And we say, of course we have the right to appeal. And they say, no. So we, and they say, you, you can uh, ask for our permission for you to appeal, but you don't have a right. And we say, that's not true. So we file a, a motion in front of the, of the judge of the appellate court, a motion for leave to file an appeal as a matter of right, which seems ridiculous, but that's what we did. And the more, even more ridiculous, the judge denied it and said we didn't have a right to appeal. We said, well, you're wrong, too. And so we then asked that, that, that it be reheard, and a five-judge panel heard it, and they all agreed we didn't have a right to appeal. So we said, okay, now we're in some kind of like, you know, Alice in the legal wonderland here. And so we decided that we would file a writ of mandamus, but it turned out in New York, the highest court of the state of New York could not, man, we could not, Mandamus, but they didn't have jurisdiction. So we decided to file a writ of mandamus in the court demanding that they order themselves to do what they're to correct the illegality. And that worked. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody woke up and realized you know, what, what was going on, and that court, uh, we got a call from the clerk of the court saying that uh, we're, we now have the right to appeal, but would we withdraw our motion, our, our, our mandamus action, they'll give us our filing feedback. So it looks like they just did it spontaneously. So that's what we, we just wanted to appeal. So we did that. So if you go to the court, it looks like uh, we five to nothing, we lost, and then all of a sudden five to nothing, we win. Uh, so the important thing was that we were finally able to appeal. When we did that, we then entered you know, even further into Alice and the Wonderland because obviously somebody was mad that we were in front of them. So, we, so it was a horrible decision that made no legal sense whatsoever. Uh, I think it's fair to say that every sentence of the decision was wrong. Uh, and, and we were so irritated about that that we actually annotated every single sentence and put it up on our website uh, to show that every single sentence of that judicial decision was wrong. And you can read it right over at uh, nonhumanrights.org. Read the first department decision, and you can see our annotation showing that every single sentence of that decision is wrong. Uh, so we currently have that case. Uh, we've asked the High Court of New York to please do something about this. The odds are they won't, because they only take, uh, they can take a discretionary, in a discretionary way, and they can, they usually take three or five percent of the cases, and they are not likely to take this simply because they're not likely to take anything. But but they, they might. And one of the reasons that they might do it is that we have been assembling, uh, or, or more and more uh, people have been, uh, have been asking us, you know, what can we do? And they've been filing amicus, amicus curiae or friend of the court briefs on, on our behalf. And so in, and there are now four sets of amicus curiae that have been filed asking the High Court of New York to hear our case. One of them is by Harvard Law School professor Lawrence Tribe, who's one of, uh, who's one of the most uh, you know, well-known and important constitutional law professors you know, in the United States and has, uh, has argued more cases from the United States Supreme Court than any other lawyer. He says, take the case, the, other people, the, the lower court was wrong. A second one is the Center for Constitutional Rights, which has done a lot of work with habeas corpus, with Guantanamo inmates, and one case is from the United States Supreme Court. A third are two habeas corpus lawyers, including one who works in Guantanamo. But perhaps the most interesting one was a consortium of 17 philosophers 
got together and filed an amicus curia brief, and in which they pointed out to the court that not only was it making, if you believe us, making elementary legal errors, but it was making, they were making elementary philosophical errors. And they asked the judge to hear the case uh, because uh, in, 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 in order to, uh, to stop that. We were absolutely amazed. We actually got on the conference call with them, 17 philosophers. And we were absolutely stunned that they all, that they, they were like cohesive. They, you know, they didn't agree with each other on anything. <laughs> exactly. But together they were like, they were, you know, they were there and ready to, to, uh, to do it. And they, they turned out to be you know, utterly amazing people. They, they got the amicus curia brief done. And academics, you know, I'm only a part-time academic for a long time. But within a week of doing that, they also had a book deal <laughs> to, uh, to, 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 which they're doing chapters that are based on the amicus curia. Uh, uh, brief, and they also uh, uh, have a, an op-ed piece in this Sunday's upcoming uh, New York Times. Uh, so they, they know what they're doing uh, in, in more ways than one. So what the Non-Human Rights Project now you know, is doing is we're continuing to litigate our cases involving chimpanzees in New York. Depending upon what the Court of Appeals does, which is the highest court of New York, we made them file a lawsuit on behalf of, of an elephant in the Bronx Zoo. Uh, we first began filing lawsuits in Connecticut, a lawsuit on behalf of, of three elephants who were, are uh, kept in a, tra in a traveling circus. And um, something that really makes me angry to see elephants abused, uh, angrier than almost any, anything else. I don't know why. And so um, uh, we have that lawsuit. That was the one in which the judge said, um, it, your suit's frivolous because no one's ever filed suit before on behalf of, of, of a non-human animal. And, we're just taking a, an appeal off. We're also going to actually be filing a second with habeas corpus, and we're going to try to get it from another judge. So they try again. And uh, if not, we'll take them off. We're also uh, look, looking at California cases right now. We're likely to be filing suit on behalf of, of a uh, chimpanzee, elephant, and or the orcas who are imprisoned at SeaWorld. So we're, we're looking at, at, at those. And we've also begun you know, to realize that that the, the terrible abuse and exploitation of non-human animals is just not, is not a problem within the United States, obviously. So over the, the last few years, we've begun to reach out to uh, groups of lawyers uh, or, and, and, and kind of put out an APB for people who are interested in us to go to work with lawyers in other countries who so either through their judicial system or through their parliaments are trying to get legal personhood or some kind of of fundamental rights for non-human animals, so so that's what, so I you know, so I, I visit people with, with legal groups in, in uh, Sweden, in Finland, and there's, we've been working with a group in London for, for years now in Argentina. And by the way, uh, that was the first time that the theories that we've been working on uh, bore fruit. Last November, a chimpanzee named Cecilia, who was imprisoned in the Mendoza Zoo, was the subject of a real case. The judge found that Cecilia was a non-human person, issued a writ of habeas corpus, ordered her release from the zoo, and sent to a sanctuary in Brazil. Um, there was also in, in Colombia a speckled bear named Chucho. Someone brought a lawsuit using the similar kinds of arguments. Uh, <coughs> lost at the first level, lost at the second level, lost at the third level, and is right up and is now up at the at the fourth level. Uh, so we're working on giving a, a talk to the M Malaysian Bar Association in Kuala Lumpur in a, in a few weeks. In Hong Kong, uh, we, we've repeatedly gone to India. We're working to, to, with um, groups there to try to get uh, uh, elephants, at least our, at least some elephants, seen as persons uh, with certain kinds of fundamental rights. You know, in Australia, New Zealand, Spain, uh, France, and Switzerland, we were working with the folks in Switzerland. But uh, they seem to be able to do a real good job on their own. That's not that they need our help. Um, so what, what we do is we go in and we kind of stay in the background and say, if you need our help, we'll give you whatever experience we have. But you know, we're like the we're the foreigners and we're just there in the background. You guys go ahead and do what you think you know, needs to be done in your legal or your private parliamentary system. Uh, so in a longer nutshell than I, I would have wanted. Uh, that's what the Non-Human Rights Project does, and that's, that's our struggle. And so what I'd really like to do is answer questions or have a discussion about it. So thank you.